Okay, so we're live right now. Um, I mainly want to start this off uh, just making sure that all of our levels are good and that everything is working and then I get the green light from uh, YouTube that I've set this up correctly. <laughs> and then we will dive right in. So uh, let me know in the chat, guys, uh, how is everything looking and sounding? Um, if there are any issues, if it's clipping, if it's freezing. <laughs> You guys know the drill, those of you who've been here for a while. Good to see familiar names in the chat. Brandon, good to see you. DMG, heart you. A lot of familiar names, which is great. We'll get going here in about a minute, so. No clipping for you? Okay, that's good. What if I move it, like, r really close? If I go, like, right here. <laughs> Cheers from Germany. Makes me think. Of, makes me wonder what time it is there. Okay, I think no drop frames. I think things are good. <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's get going here uh, with today's live stream. I know I haven't done one of these in a while, so um, so we're back. <laughs> um, Yeah, lots of good stuff coming in. So what we'll do, uh, it's the same sort of format that we've been running with for these sorts of live impressions, live reviews, whatever you want to call it, uh, where we'll talk about that first, then we will get into re you know regular Q&A, and then after that we will get into spicy hours. So save your spicy questions for then. Um, but right now, um, I, just before we get kind of get going here, um, I want to do the usual thing. I'll let you guys know that if you would like to participate in our Discord, we have one of those linked in the description down below. We also have the community forum also linked in the description down below. I still need to actually post the measurements of this up on the thread, but uh, we'll do that uh, shortly thereafter. So if you're watching this after, it should be up there. Um, and um, of course, uh, if you guys are interested in all things headphones, uh, check out headphones.com. That's also where we have the audio files, the guides, reviews, and features, educational articles, all that kind of stuff. And it is also a place where you can buy some headphones if you should so choose. Obviously, you don't have to buy from there, but that is that is the company that uh, runs this channel. So uh, if you would like to support us, consider checking us out. Um, so, with that out of the way, let's dive into the Hi-Fi Man HE-1000 V2. <laughs> uh, there are many different uh, iterations of this headphone. Oh, and just a disclaimer here, this uh, this is a production unit. So, this was sent up, I, I believe, uh, on loan. Uh, this was sent up uh, by headphones.com. So, this is a production unit. Um, and... Yeah, so uh, let's let's get into the Hi-Fi Man HE-1000 V2. And just, I, I've seen some of the comments already about the potential Stealth Magnet version. This is not the Stealth Magnet version that I'm aware of. I believe this is just the regular version. Um, if it turns, I, I will dig into this, but if it turns out that this is the Stealth version, um, I, I have no reason to believe that it is, guys, and you'll see why. Um, but uh, yeah, I will update, uh, I will update uh, the information afterwards. But um, this is the non-stealth for everything that I'm seeing right now. Um, and I actually haven't even seen a, a, anything to do with the, a stealth magnet version of this one. But we will talk about the stealth magnet thing in a little bit as well. Um, I think we should do that after this. So uh, for those of you guys who are wondering about the stealth magnets, I will talk about that as well. But first, let's dive into build, design, comfort, aesthetics, uh, and accessories. And just a quick note on the cable. You do get two of them. But this is the cable. The hell is this? <laughs> this is the, uh, as we you know affectionately know it, the surgical tubing style of cable. So you get one that's a XLR, which is nice, and then you also get a uh, three point five or quarter inch. Uh, is the stream still working? It seems like it. Maybe YouTube is just paused on me. I don't know. Uh, so that's the cable, uh, not one that I think is particularly great, but that's that's what that is. Um, uh, the connectors on the bottom side are 3.5 millimeter. Uh, yes, three. Yes, I believe 3.5 millimeter. Um, so for the rest of the build, the design, let's uh, let's talk about that. 
I am not a fan, it's no secret, of the sort of wood veneer style thing going on here, right? Like this this, piece, this sort of wood ring that goes around it. I get why they do it. Wood is a popular thing on headphones, and this is a way for them to sort of like, you know, speak that kind of design language. Um, and you see it on the Susvara as well, to a certain degree. I will say this has a different color than what is, or like a different sort of uh, sheen to the wood um, than what you find on the Susvara, uh, which is cool it's interesting um and the rest of the design is this sort of silver um metal material you know for the yokes as well and you get a, a, a leather leather feeling headband strap with holes in it which is nice uh you get the clicks on the side right so if you're a, a big head you can you know go all the way up on the clicks if you want uh and it does have cup swivel right that's the sort of the, the benefit of this style of headband uh, for the cups themselves, they have the egg shape to them, which many of you guys will be familiar with if you've seen any of the other Hi-Fi Man, Eggy Man uh, cups in the past. Um, and you can actually, if you shine light through, you can even see kind of through to the driver, which is pretty cool. Uh, big, massive pads, huge openings for ears, always great. But this is one thing to consider if you have a short head. <laughs> uh, there's a chance that the bottom part here can actually stick down below your jawline and it can actually compromise the seal. That's always something that, that it, it has the potential to happen with these style of uh, cups. Uh, when I wear it, it's very comfortable. I got no issues with the comfort. I think, you know, if you have a larger than average head, this is gonna accommodate it reasonably well as it does for me, right? Um, there's nothing really that I can complain about as far as comfort. Um, I, I think that, you know, for me, I actually find the Edition XS to be even more comfortable. The Edition XS is the much less expensive one, the one that's that's uh, around $500. Um, and, uh, but, you know, with that headband, but I think a lot of people had trouble with that headband. So this is the more traditional style of headband that Hi-Fi Men's had in the past. Just one, actu one comment here on price. I know I didn't mention that earlier. Uh, the price for this, this is currently on sale um, in various different places that I've seen for, I think, $2,000. It used to be... Uh, quite a bit more than that. I think it used to be even like three thousand dollars, and now it is in the you know one thousand nine hundred ninety nine, so two thousand dollar price bracket, um, which is interesting to note. I don't know if this is going to be like a consistent thing, like they've done with their other uh, headphones in the past, where they've dropped the price as a sale price and then kept it at that price. I don't know if that's what's going on with this one, but I would not be shocked. I'll just put it that way. Um, but, you know, for all I know, you know, a week from now, they could put it back up to three grand. I don't know. Um, but uh, with that out of the way, that's basically the ergonomics of the design. The build quality does not inspire the most confidence in the sense of I would still want to baby this and be very careful with this because, you know, um, it, it's in order to keep it lightweight, it, it feels like, you know, this is not the like by, I'm just thinking by contrast some other headphones are, are, are built better, right? But this is lighter, so it's more comfortable. That's kind of the trade-off that you have to go with. Um, but as far as, like, the, the build on this compared to the build on some of Hi-Fi Men's newer headphones, I actually think the build here feels a lot better. So that I don't know if that gives context. Um, but for Hi-Fi Men headphones, this is, um, this is, I would say, on the better side for Hi-Fi Men headphones for the build quality. Um, so that's, that's what that is. Um... Now, let's uh, talk about the sound quality, and we'll dive into the graphs here. Thank you, TechMed. Keep it up. we Will do. <laughs> All right. You guys ready for the squiggly lines? Behold, the squiggly lines. All right. So this is the uh, frequency response of the HiFam Edition. And, uh, sorry, House <laughs> Edition Access. HiFam and HE1000 V2. Um, and so there's a familiarity and similarity to hi fi Men's other headphones, and I will compare this to the Aria Stealth here in a second. But um, this is what you get uh, with, uh, you can see the different seatings there. It has that usual sort of hi fi Men dip in the mids, and then it is a little bit, you know, brighter in the ear gain. So you can think of this as being somewhat neutral bright. If you're looking at the target here, this is the Harman combined target. And for those who are unaware, we do not want our headphones to measure flat on a raw graph because our ears impact incoming sound. And this is a measurement taken at the eardrum, simulated at the eardrum. Um, and uh, so that's why you see the rise going up here like that. Um, but uh, if you just for a moment take a look at the bass, you can actually see in the bottom part of the ear gain there is, you know, some warmth. So 
um, like I'm gonna say ear gain. That's the that's basically the the way that your ears in, impact incoming sound. Um, the amplification that happened as a result of your you know ears impacting the sound. Um, and so the effects of the ear here mean that um, you know you'd probably this is probably going to come across a little bit thicker and warmer in the presentation because it is in the upper bass lower mid section. So where fundamental tones for certain types of music. Um, you know, come through or are often prominent, you will get that sort of sense of fullness and richness coming through, but it's not massively boosted or anything. So it's not like, you know, super bleedy or anything like that into the different frequency ranges. It's just a little bit more full there as a result. Um, but then of course it doesn't have the sub bass shelf. So there's that. And that's expected on open back planar magnetic headphones, basically. Um, then yeah, um, the rest of it we can think of as basically neutral bright. Uh, you have a little bit more of a brighter tilt here with you know, the frequencies above the target and I want to show you guys just what this looks like with the same smoothing as the target because this is something that often gets missed when we do this kind of stuff that's what it looks like with the same smoothing as the target right so um, you can see that it's a little bit higher there for you know uh, the frequency response uh, in the upper mids and in the treble meaning that there's a little bit it's a little bit brighter a little bit airier a little bit uh, more clarity focused however the trade-off is that for more aggressive music this is likely to come across as a little bit more on the fatiguing side um you know so if you're listening to like you know rock and metal and stuff like that i probably would recommend not this headphone uh, but um yeah apart from that this is very similar to the style of tuning that you get with hi men's other headphones um i just see someone asking there uh poppy talks asking about shout um so this is the thing right with this style of tuning it actually isn't really shouty because the balance between the upper mids here, or I guess it's like, yeah, this region here, the balance between 2K and 4K uh, and and the lower treble above it is intact. It's, it's the shape that you want to avoid shout. Now, it is still going to be a little bit on the glary side for certain types of tones. Like, you know, if you have, if you're listening to heavy metal and you have, there's a ton of like electric guitar, the upper edges of those guitar tones, like the bite is going to come through a little bit more strongly. So I don't recommend this for those genres, just straight up. I mean, it's not, unless you're looking for that, right? Like if you want your music to sound with a little bit more extra bite, if, if you're listening to those genres, then by all means, but that's not the way that I would want to listen to those genres, if that makes sense. Um, that's a personal thing as is many things to do with sound quality. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't find this one to be shouty, even though it has very strong ear gain. Um, I mean, it it is on the edge of being fatiguing though for certain genres. My preferred genres with HE-1000 and actually also the Aria, um, my preferred genres are um, jazz, acoustic and classical. And it, those are the genres that I happen to really enjoy. Stuff that is also like, I'm just thinking like there's other genres too, like the singer songwriter stuff is great with this. Um, there are certain uh, blues recordings that would be great. Soul is good. R&B is solid with this. Um, you know, I, I just wouldn't use it for rock metal and uh, EDM, you know, the more like uh, genres where this level of ear gain is bound to be a bit fatiguing, right? Let's just put it that way. Um, okay, so that's that. I want to just quickly draw your attention to, um, this is the average result. I want to draw your attention to the upper treble here because this is where the, the stealth magnets, if there is a revision to this headphone at some point and they add the stealth magnets, this is where that's going to show up. And I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that with the Aria style. Actually, well, let's talk about that now. So let's just compare this to the Aria V3. And there actually were some people who were suggesting that the high fem and he 1000 v2 or or v1 is the same driver as the as the aria i i strongly suspect it is not and whether that is a difference of diaphragm material or some sort of structural differences i don't know but this result is different enough where i would expect it to not be the same driver at all and it doesn't sound the same um and certainly not uh because of you know the stealth magnets but even before the stealth magnets uh because the other one that's the only real difference apart from some changes in the lower frequencies as well but um in the treble it is this that is what the stealth magnets affect so if they release a a future version here the upper treble uh would be a bit brighter um for the for the v2 and i 
straight up don't think that it is necessary. I mean, it is something where it might be enjoyable. It might be totally fine. No issues there with it in situations where it's implemented well. Um, and I think there's a sense in which on the Aria V3, it actually makes a certain amount of sense because you have pretty strong upper mid range and lower treble, you know? And so if you, if you have that, you want there to be more air up top. You want there to be more 12K um, because otherwise you're going to end up with that sort of compressed kind of uh, congested sound for percussive tones and cymbal hits and things like that. And having the upper harmonics there be, you know, sufficiently elevated makes it so that that's not the case. It, it, everything kind of, like, the, the, the everything sounds like it, it resolves well, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, if they release a future Stealth Magnet version for the V2, or I'm sure they will, uh, if they haven't already, we could expect it to be, you know, a little higher here in this region. Um, but but apart from that, the comparison for the frequency response between the HE-1000 and the Aria, um, to me, indicates that there is a difference in the driver, um, not just the stealth magnets. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say that for the overall balance, there is a, there is a extra sense of refinement that I hear with the HE-1000 over the Aria. Um, it sounds a bit smoother, and it could just be the shape of the ear gain, uh, you know, a, a little bit. Um, but I also wanted to show you guys what I hear, or what I did uh, with EQ. So let me just show you guys. So that's the frequency response by default. And with EQ, uh, this is what I did. And, and I really kept most of the shape there intact because I wanted to kind of just see how that sounded uh, to see if the HRTF -E effects of uh, uh, so the head related transfer function, you know, if, if I kept that intact, would it still sound good? And it did. So I just dropped it with a um, with a shell filter. And so some of that characteristic that it has, um, I, I just left it there. But you know, for the rest, I let me just hold on, you can't really see that well. Um, let me just pop that. Okay, so for the rest, yeah, I gave it a bass boost. And then I kind of evened up the mids a little bit. Um, and then just kept some of the rest of that intact. And when you smooth this again, to the same degree as the target, right, it's pretty close. That's, that's, that's reasonable, right? I think this Maybe you could drop a little bit more, depending on the genres that you're listening to. But, um, oops, that's the raw. There we go. Uh, but that's the end up. That's the result that I ended up uh, going with uh, for the filters that I chose. And I will leave, uh, I'll add a link to the stream here afterwards um, for my EQ settings with this one. Um, but let me just swap over back to the camera. So that is all of the squiggly lines. Bam, I've returned. Uh, <laughs> um, so, how, so that's how it is on the graph, right? And I'm gonna, again, just describe it once again as neutral bright, similar to what you get with the other Hi-Fi Man headphones that are around uh, with, with the egg shape style, right? Very similar to that. But I do think that overall, this has a slightly more refined presentation overall to the treble compared to the Aria, uh, the V3 specifically. Um, and I find this to be more resolving. And speaking of which, let's get into the subjective technicalities stuff, which is difficult to identify in frequency response. The HE-1000, again, there are, I think there's a narrative that this is just a more expensive Aria and I can understand why that narrative exists, but to me, it doesn't sound like that. Now, whether this is due to the changes, the differences in FR or FR at the eardrum or whatever, subjectively, this sounds more refined, more resolving, more clear <laughs> for the images. Um, it sounds more precise, a little bit less, less. Um, I actually found it to be a little like less fatiguing, not in terms of level, but in terms of balance. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, it sounds super clean, uh, very spacious for the presentation, extremely good sense of depth and instrument separation, some of the best that I've heard. And this is unsurprising because it is in a similar sort of style to what you get with other hi fi headphones that also perform well for these same qualities. And the same drawbacks that those headphones have, I find this one has as well, which is that it is not the most punchy and impactful uh, and engaging uh, as far like if you compare this to like the Focals, for example, like a Utopia is going to slam harder than this. Um, same with other there are other dynamic driver headphones that do that as well. Um, so if you're really looking for that sort of slammy thing for your 
for your EDM for your EDMs, <laughs> this is probably not the one that I would choose. Uh, I would choose, uh, yeah, probably something with a dynamic driver that's really punchy. Um, this one is more for, again, that sort of sense of refinement, uh, you know, instrument separation, and, and it's wonderful for jazz and classical and acoustic. Um, that's, that, this really, it nails it for those genres. Um, and, you know, even when you sort of dial it in with EQ, it's, I, I find that, you know, it's a better match for my ear. <laughs> um, when I, you know, after dialing it in there, but you know, if you're an older listener, you know, I don't think you're going to have an issue with the trouble with this. Most likely, you'll be fine. Um, one other thing that I just wanted to note, um, I just want to pop back over to the graph here. Um, when talking about soundstage, all right, this type of presentation where you have the dip in the mids, around like 1.5 to 2k, and you have an elevation to the mid treble, like that, like like the way that it has, kind of. That is not, I mean, it's not quite the same, but it is not unlike what you get with the HD-800S. The HD-800S does similar types of things, and this is kind of like the soundstage enhancing effect the frequency response can have. And I think that's why the HD-1000V2 sounds particularly spacious. Um, and yeah, for all the rest of the subjective qualities like, you know, incisiveness and, it, you know, being able to hear the finer little nuances in the music it's bloody outstanding uh, so that's all i have to say about that but i will compare it to um the susvara because i think folks were wanting that as well um the susvara i find has a simply better tonality better frequency response because at least for me because it is not quite as bright right the susvara is a little more balanced there in the in the kind of upper mids and, and treble it is a little bit less bright so the overall overall balance is i think a little bit uh a little bit more versatile i'll put it that way as far as the sort of intangible qualities i hear them to be similarly good at similar things i would still place this as far ahead of the he 1000 v2 with that said i think that you know especially for those who are in the eq gang you can get you, you know if you were to dial this in you know however you want you can get a lot out of this so if you do find uh, if you want those qualities, but you do find, you know, if you're trouble sensitive, you can you can drop that down, and you don't need to go out and get a Sizvara to get that kind of balance. Is what I'm saying. You could get very close um, between the two. Yeah, obviously, I think the Sizvara is the better headphone. I think there's no question. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's like the Sizvara has a, a closer you know type of presentation to. Um, Honestly, it's closer to the target. <laughs> um, I think there's like this this very subtle thing on the Sizvara that's at like four and a half k, and a, and a very subtle thing that's at around seven k. Uh, those are sort of the two you know quirks with the Sizvara. But other than that, it's this sort of effortless thing. And and I and there's a similarity in that sense with the HE1000, but um, it the HE1000 is still a bit brighter. Put it that way. Um. So okay. Uh, that's basically all I have to say about the HE1000 V2. Um, well, let me just ask the question of whether or not it, it's recommended for me. Yeah, it's definitely recommended. Am I going to put it, which tier would I put it in? I, I struggle with, it's, it's one of the higher tiers. It's, I was initially thinking like tier one, maybe like the, you know, this is a potential end game depending on, you know, how you use it. And it's very close to that. I think it is just a small step behind uh, tier one for me. That's how I'll put it. And I think uh, for those, for what I just described, right, for people who are listening to those particular genres, um, I think it could be that. I think it could be in that sort of endgame territory. So, yes, I do thoroughly recommend it. However, I also think that you need to be conscious and cognizant of the genres that you're listening to and specifically how you want them to sound, because if you're trouble sensitive or you don't like that kind of slightly brighter tilt, the extra little sense of the details up there um, coming through, then, you know, if you want something warmer, then this probably is not the headphone for you. But okay, that's the HE1000V2. Uh, let's, um, let's, let's talk about it. Q&A, let's go. Um, I'm just going to start reading some of your comments here. 
would love to see your system for EQ. Yep, I will post, I will add those here shortly because I haven't actually posted those yet. I was still tinkering. <laughs> Very different drivers between the Aria and the HE-1000 V2. Yeah, that's that's my feeling as well here. They do not sound the same to me. Like, I know there are people saying that. They don't sound the same to me. Um, they've released the Stealth Magnet version. Yeah, it could be that that's the HE-1000 SE. I don't know. I've listened to the HE-1000 SE and it's, it's bright as shit. <laughs> uh, I would not use that one without EQ personally. But it is very detailed. I'll give you that. Um... Yeah, so, okay, I wanted to comment a little bit on the Stealth Magnets thing, right? There's no reason to assume that the Stealth Magnets magically improve the subjective technicalities or whatever, all that stuff that we're wanting to sort of ascribe to headphone performance. Like, there is a, there's an idea that, you know, the Stealth Magnets is this big revolutionary thing. It is not. It is a parameter that they can tweak, that they can decide to implement, that they can add to the process of their headphone manufacturing and it will affect the frequency response so you will hear it you will hear it right please don't mistake me for saying that you won't that the stealth magnets don't make a difference they do make an acoustic difference it's just that you can also measure exactly where that difference is and it is specifically in the upper treble and sometimes that's good to have more you know pre energy and presence there and sometimes it is not so it's really up to them to figure out, you know, okay, this is the one that we want to put stealth magnets on, and maybe we don't do it on this one because it's already too bright, right? It's up to them to really use or leverage that parameter to their benefit. So when people talk about stealth magnets as this big revolutionary thing, just please make no mistake, it is not something that you cannot measure. You can measure it. <laughs> and uh, and here's the here is what an interesting experiment would be. If you took a headphone that had stealth magnets versus one that doesn't, right? Like say you're going with Arias, right? Or not even Arias, like Ananda Stealth versus regular Ananda. And you EQ'd the regular Ananda to match the Ananda Stealth, would it sound the same? I bet it would. I bet it would. More trouble doesn't mean more details. Yep. I agree. And this also reinforces kind of my suspicion and assumption about all of this question around technicalities, subjective aspects, and all of that qualia stuff. I think it is to do with the diaphragm material. I think that is the key parameter that contributes the most to whether something is good or bad for this. And whether, that's a, whether that shows a difference of FR at the eardrum or not, Right, that's the thing that, in my view, we should be focusing on. Less so the thing about stealth magnets or other, you know, other potential parameters. Because <laughs> actually, the crazy thing that I was doing is I okay, when I was EQing this headphone and I was comparing it to other headphones, I'd actually I was comparing it to a Sundara that I EQ to basically the same. It's not even remotely close. Like it does not compare. Like this is Vara Sandara is 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 just not even remotely close to the level of like effortlessness and like depth that you get with this for the experience, right? It's and anybody who tells you that they sound the same, I I question <laughs> I question what why they'd say that if they if they're listening to them EQ to the same result because they really don't. Um, I would question if they've ever actually heard both of them side by side at the same volume. Um, but let's let's continue here. Yeah, so I don't know if the HE one thousand SE is the stealth version, or if there is a a, a different HE one thousand V two stealth magnet version. <laughs> I have no idea, guys. Um, this is just how I'm reporting this one, and I don't think you need to care. <laughs> Where is Metal 571? Where in the world is Metal 571? Yeah. We should all, um, you know, we should have a seance <laughs> to communicate, to commune with the legendary Metal 571. He'll watch this later and, and laugh, I'm sure. Uh, I need to have him on the live stream again. 
Oh, I see. Yeah, somebody's asking about the Sundara. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's continue. More trouble don't mean more details. <laughs> Thanks for answering the question. Subscribe yesterday. Welcome. I'm glad we could be helpful. There is stoppage to the sound wave on the non-stealth. It doesn't mean anything. Um, I mean, it means like measurable yes you can measure the effect of that but does that mean you can't like you can get that same effect with frequency response and other headphones that don't have the stealth magnets so there's no there's no magic <laughs> there, there is a real tangible acoustic effect of stealth magnets and it shows up on the graph predictably now i will say some people some people will report that that makes it sound more detailed uh, I I'm not saying that's well, I'm not saying they're you know misreporting things right like they may they may think that that's actually what's going on right because this is gets into the question of like is it all just frequency response and you know maybe right <laughs> but to me the bigger thing is the effect of the diaphragm material for that quality right the technicalities the subjective stuff that is a far greater you know thing that we can't figure out a far far more important thing that isn't you know easily available on the graph. What's your favorite pizza topping? Pineapple. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I mean, I, can you really pick one? I like, I like pizzas that are done in like that more like classic style. But I have had some some amazing pizzas that were like gourmet pizzas that are that are like um. They're like uh, are these like brie cheese and stuff like that. It's awesome. The HE6 SEV2 is not the same build quality and harder to drive needing a powerful amp, but it's still high MN sound, SIG, and not as bright. They complement each other. Man, I don't really know what's going on with HE6 SE versus the V2 there, but they, yeah, they are not the same, and I think this could be due to the housing, like the chassis design. And some of the results that were measured looked very strange to me. The one that I measured was very, very good. Um, yeah, had a similar sound signature, maybe not quite as bright, but it was very, very good, I thought. But then I saw another measurement of one that looked closer to the V1 with that really strong upper mid-range peak, and I was like, what the hell is going on? So I don't know. I need to get another one in, is what I'm saying. I need to get more in. It's That's a crazy deal, <laughs> to be clear. I recommend it. It's high up on my good value list, as long as it's consistent. How does it compare to the LC5? All right, this is a spicy take. The tuning with HU1000 V2, in my opinion, is better than that of the LCD5 because the LCD5 is too dark in the treble given how high up its upper mid range is. Now it actually measures like it is more correct, you know, for a studio type environment, but I don't find that it sounds as pleasant, all right? That's, a, that's an important distinction. Um, and to me, it just causes that sort of glare. Now, with EQ, the LCD-5 is one of the most remarkable headphones I've ever heard in my life. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's. I wish they would make a, a wider headband, like even wider than the one that they made so that I can actually, you know, enjoy it because right now it's just too, it's too clampy, but that's probably what I would buy. If I were a normal-sized, head-sized person, I would probably get the LCD-5 and just EQ it. It's remarkable. Um... So for those subjective qualities, the LCD-5 is even more impressive, for sure. Definitely. Do you need a high current amp? Ah, okay, I should talk about amplification with this. Um, I didn't find that there was any meaningful change with amplification. Like, like yeah, you'd want an amplifier, but it's not... I didn't... You know, I, was, I did use the IH6, I used a bunch of other amplifiers that are around, and I didn't find there to be any, you know significant difference or change worth commenting on um it's it's i would plug in you know the to the power calculator i don't want to tell people like oh yeah you need to buy 
you know, an app with this much power because I don't know actually how much power it <laughs> it'll require to get loud enough. And that also changes a little bit depending on how loud you listen. But um, I found that with this one, it was pretty much the same off of the solid state sources that I tried it with. Um, obviously, it changes more off of tube amps. How are your dental implants doing? <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 mean, if I recommend getting them. Yeah, you, sh you have to, you should. <laughs> uh, real audio reviews. Thank you. Let me get you get to your question here. Um, why isn't there more tubeless IEMs? You get true 3D sound close to speaker in a box. If I doesn't take this into account. Imagine Harman tubeless IEM. So a couple of things on that. I think we'll get more and interesting, more and better, interesting data from measurements done on the fifty one twenty eight, because it is more human like. I don't know what the actual like. I know that the, the measurement rigs that we use they are they are excellent. They are you know industry standard for a reason. They're meant to simulate human ears, but you know it's not wrong to say that the fifty one twenty eight is more human like. You know, we're closer to like an actual human. And I think that for some of the more, you know, picky questions that we might have, maybe we'll find, you know, some answers there. I don't know. But uh, I think, you know, just because you don't see it on a graph right now doesn't mean that we couldn't at some point measure some of the effects that you're describing. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in addition to that, the question, why are there more tubeless IEMs? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. Uh, I, th I think that there are, I think there is a trend, but it's not like, it's not like, you know, you know how like in the industry, there's, the, there are a lot of technological buzzwords, right? Like, like stealth magnets. That's one of them. Like, uh, you know, talking about certain special materials is another one. Um, another one would be you know, the whole flux density question. There, these sorts of, sorts of buzzwords get used a lot because they tell an interesting and important story about the technology that's being implemented. Um, and it's not to say that those things don't have acoustic effects because they do, but the important thing is that they have acoustic effects. <laughs> and oftentimes this is stuff, I mean, generally this is stuff where, you know, those effects could be m measured and you'd be able to identify where the, where those you know, what those effects are. So when it comes to the tubeless question, um, this is another one of those that it's a buzzword that, you know, could you get those effects some other way? Maybe, but uh, for whatever reason, yeah, it just hasn't taken off as a, one of the techno, like the, one of the major technological buzzwords. It, it, it's, you know, taken off enough to where, you know, you're asking me about it. <laughs> um, you know, I think 64 Audio were kind of pioneering that. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, <laughs> they sound pretty darn good. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm also a bit surprised that that hasn't been as strong of a trend in the more budget segment. Have you already answered the question in comparison to the Aria? Yes, yes, indeed. It's better. <laughs> the AG-1000 is better. <laughs> Um, what's a good starter planar? Sundara, probably, or HE HE four hundred SE, probably, either of those two, or X four, depending which one's cheaper. Um, Endgame for classical music listening. I mean, that's up there, for sure. Probably, like true Endgame for classical would probably be the Warwick Acoustics Imperio, <laughs> or maybe the. I don't know, I haven't heard the HE1, so, or at least, yeah, that's, like, the stuff that's, like, not attainable, right? I, f I have heard the Shangri-La Senior, that might be on that list, too. Uh, but, you know, it's like, even if you get to listen to that stuff, it's like, for 15 minutes <laughs> at a show, it's not enough time. Um... Have you had a chance to listen to the Moondrop Void? I have. I do have a Void in the studio, but I need to get it replaced with a new, with a replacement one, right, to see how good that is. Um, so I, I, I actually, it's still in its packaging. I haven't taken it out of the packaging yet. So I'll, I'll need to connect with. Um, I think it's maybe Shenzhen Audio um, to see about that one.
it is it interesting that perspective of the industry experts is that headphones that measure good what do you mean by that will be good for all genres but that doesn't actually seem to be the case so it's not quite like that um, i mean yeah i get what you're saying that um so yeah the genre question it's true that you can't you you can't like you know with a coarse grain brush just like sweep across a genre and say oh yeah this you know this headphone is uh, is good or bad for that genre you can't do that because within those genres you can have very different recording styles that are going to be that's going to have a bigger effect right it's the recording style but at the same time i find there are common trends within genres not all genres but you know so for example in modern jazz there's a common trend in recording style in you know modern rock and metal there's common there's recording styles mixing mastering styles um and i think that there are there are ways in which you know there are certain types of music where if you have too much of a certain region it's going to be fatiguing where other types of music there won't be so i get both sides of the argument there um and and you know the research also does show that there is an effect on i think it had to do with like time that people spent listening uh, for for you know different genres like the effect of that so yeah I don't think it's as straightforward as saying you know uh, this response curve is ideal for all genres um, I think it's I mean ma manufacturers might say that I don't think that's true um, but uh, it is also true the reasoning behind that like from what Fang Bian said a long time ago the reasoning behind that all behind why they say that it you know it's not the genre makes sense too right so i agree that you know like if you listen to rock for example there are so many different you know ways that rock music can come across in a recording and so you can't as simply just say like oh yeah um this headphone is going to be good for that and this headphone's gonna be bad for that genre because within the genre you can have so many different presentations like Dire Straits is recorded very differently from Animal Mother, for example. <laughs> also way better. <laughs> but uh, let's just leave it at that. Why? Oh, well, somebody considers the Helios better than the U12T. Yeah, if it works for them better. I wouldn't, I personally would take the U12T over the Helios no questions asked but the reason for that is because the fit is much better on the u12t so for sound quality the helio is pretty freaking good <laughs> for sound quality you know what's weird is the other day i had a dream about mems transducers <laughs> This is this is when you go too deep as you start dreaming about about specific driver types, new technology. Uh, what headphone would come close to sound signature wise to the HD five sixty S but less sharp, six XX or six hundred HD? Honestly, more people need to hear the HD six hundred. <laughs> Um, can you compare it to the Utopia, uh, the HM1000 V2? Um, what would you choose between the two and why? Between the two, if I'm not EQing anything, probably, well, definitely Utopia. If I'm not EQing anything, Utopia. Uh, if I am able to EQ, it becomes a tougher question because um, you can do things with this that you can't really do that with, do with the Utopia. Um, just because of the excursion limit at like 107 dB. So if you want to like, you know, crank up the bass in the Utopia with the bass shelf, you're going to run into a limit there where you won't really run into a limit with this. So depending on what you want to do with it. Um, yeah, interesting question. It's an interesting question. I think for instrument separation and like that type of incisiveness, I think the HU-1000 V2 does better. For dynamics and sense of contrast and punch, the 
and physicality and impact those things <laughs> the utopia is just on another level like the utopia is probably the best out of any headphone i've heard for that um yeah i can't think of anything else um even though yeah their base level is not elevated it's it's just a very contrasty headphone um soundstage is better on this again so it's like what qualities are you interested in you know for the tonality the utopia is a bit more like neutral balanced but there's also some mid-range you know quirks in the utopia that make it really good for piano recordings and things like that but also there's a coloration there it's almost like the the opposite uh, of the he 1000 in a sense for you know where the h1000 dips down in the mid the utopia is a little forward there um okay A series of exhaustively explained videos about audio myths, burn-in, cables, balancers, unbalanced, audiophile rocks. Why, why are audiophile rocks in that category? Because <laughs> audiophile rocks are, like, the others are things that are worth talking about. Audiophile rocks are not. <laughs> um, or a Q&A with Sean Olive and Oratory 1990. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to have those guys on again. Um, big fan of both of those guys and what they do. Um I talk to Sean regularly on Twitter. <laughs> um, his, his Twitter is hilarious. Um, yeah, so interestingly, I've been I've been diving into some of these these you know myths a little bit as well. Um, so burn-in and cables are the ones that I've been kind of diving into right now. And actually, people have the wrong idea about both of these topics. Um, because they think that, you know, as soon as people are talking about burn-in, that it's immediately in the category of audiophile rocks. Or as soon as they're talking about cables, it's immediately in the category of audiophile rocks. Um, yeah. To tackle the cable thing specifically, I'll have a video coming out soon about this. But um, for certain types of headphones, cables, that particular, <laughs> particular cables can... Uh, can actually show a significantly different measured result. Uh, not in terms of the overall frequency response, even though there are differences there as well. But I'll give you an example. I Even just uh, yesterday, I was measuring a pair of headphones with two different cables. One was a default cable and one was a particularly unique, custom, ridiculous cable, right? Uh, and when measuring those, at I didn't sh the volume knob stays the same the overall balance is about 6 dB different. Like the overall SPL, like the sound pressure level is, is 6 dB different. Um, that's a lot, that's that's quite louder on the other one. And it has to do with the impedance and the relationship with that with that specific headphone, which was a basically no impedance headphone. Um, and uh, so that was the first thing is that yes, there are measurable results, measurable differences. In this case, it's mostly just sound pressure level. The second is there, there was a consistent difference in the treble, uh, where the the uh, custom one was um, was warmer. I posted these results actually in our Discord, so if you want to see those results, you can check that out. Um, but yeah, you can actually, depending on the headphones and the system that you're talking about, you can actually um, find measurable differences in in cables. Uh, very very niche specific circumstances, right? I think in the vast majority, you won't see a measurable difference. And in a blind test, people wouldn't be able to identify a difference. Um, and it, again, it all has to do with the particular headphones and the system that you're, that you're using it with. So yeah, um, it's not as simple as just saying, you know, cable believers versus cable deniers, because there is actually a physical acoustic thing that, that is happening. It's just that in the vast majority of cases, it is nonsense, <laughs> right? It, in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't make a difference um, because most headphones don't have, most headphones aren't those really weird and unique, uh, you know, types. Um, so I'll do a video uh, soon about that um, because yeah, I think, I think people go way too, like they miss some of the actual information there. Um, 
but yeah, obviously, you like I, I just to give an example, I use cables for thirty dollars that I buy off Amazon. <laughs> like <laughs> I don't care about they don't change the frequency response for any of the headphones that I would really care about you know using for a long period of time. Um, and the other difference is literally just volume with just a little bit of a difference in the treble. Do I care about that? Mm, I can just EQ. Uh, Burnin is another one that there is more to it than just believers versus deniers versus brain burnin, right? The first is that what has a bigger effect, most likely <laughs> for most headphones, is pad wear. And you can technically say that that's a physical change happening because the pads are conforming and compressing, right, over time. And that shows up there's a difference in frequency response. So it's like, yeah, there's a real thing there. Um, but if you're talking about like the driver, right, specifically that, you know, as things are moving, it is also not as complicated as believers versus deniers because the actual phenomenon that's going on there is if you talk to oratory about this <laughs> and some other people, um, they'll tell you that there is actually, there are situations where um, there is change. Um, now it's, what they're talking about is a little different from what oftentimes manufacturers are putting on the box or recommend, re recommending, you know, people do, you know, listen to this for 120 hours, you know, to burn it in and all that kind of stuff. Like what they're talking about is not that, <laughs> but and that's why for me, like people ask me about Burnin, my answer is it's not, even though it is technically a physical thing potentially that, that could happen, right? It's not something you ever have a reason to worry about, right? So to go through the process of burning in a headphone isn't really something like, this is, it ends up being a distinction without a difference. It ends up being a pointless kind of endeavor, uh, in my opinion. Unless, of course, we're talking about pad wear, in which case this is not at all pointless. <laughs> you, don't need to, you don't need to actually, you know, run the head, like play music through the headphones or whatever, uh, or pink noise or whatever. But yeah. Yeah. So these topics, like, they're not as simple as deniers versus believers, right? They There actually is something to those questions. It's just that, you know, you get placed into different camps depending on what your answer is. Um, and then people think you're in, in either case, people think you're in, you know, the, the either people think that you're crazy or they think on the other side, they think you're deaf. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's continue. Are you going to CanJam New York? Maybe. I It hasn't fully been figured out who's going from the team. Just recently got the truth here, Hexa, and I'm questioning the value of higher cost neutral IEMs. Is there much point in upgrading or is the Hexa in good enough territory? Depends how much higher end. I think at a certain point, it doesn't become, like it's the diminishing returns thing, right? It becomes less about better and more about just like something that's closer to your preference for like, you know, the tonal balance, like, you know, bass, mids, treble, like the the, the coarse grain stuff, right? Um, like personally, right now, I'm really into the, the Symphonia Meteor. Um, and that's not neutral, but it's really good sounding. <laughs> Same with the SA6. Um, um, What's the status of the in-house headphone design? It's 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 a little bit on hold right now because we need to figure out what's going on with that. So there's no update. All I will say is that we have a sufficient driver. <laughs> but I, yeah, I can't really say more about that because it's it's a research project. What's my opinion on R2R DAX? Um, I don't really have one. I I need to test more, measure more. I need to dive into that world because for me, I don't really care about amps and DAX. <laughs> like, even if they, my opinion on amps and DAX, like let, let me just get that out of the way for people who don't understand or don't know it. Um, 
there are situations where amps and DACs might make a difference, like in blind tests, but it's not something that we wouldn't expect to see by just the amplifier type or, you know, what we find in measurements or things like that. Um, obviously, Synad is nonsense. Like, caring about Synad is is ridiculous. Like, we did a video on that. Um, but... Um, but the idea of some sort of magical property from different amplifiers because they're more expensive, I like. It's, I'm not interested in that. Um, other people might be, and that's cool. But um, and if they find that difference, that's awesome. Um, but I, I, I personally have not heard enough of any, like in blind tests, like a, like with the ABX switcher. I've I haven't found a difference from one amplifier to another, unless we're talking about situations where we, we should expect there to be a difference, like with specific headphones that have very different relationships with output impedance, for example, or um, the way that, the, you know, a difference of behavior on current base sources, for example, or something like that, uh, or two, tube amplifiers, right? Like there are, there are times when you would expect there to be differences. Um, and that's, then you find them. But when doing blind AB tests, like with the switcher, um with um yeah with like more normal sources i don't find differences among them like all of the stuff from topping an smsl <laughs> it all sounds the same <laughs> i'm just gonna say that um you know and 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 the, the lower price stuff often sounds the same as the higher price stuff right like when you're doing the comparisons between that too so i don't really care about that and even when you even in the times when you do find there to be a difference it is never enough to where it is proportional to the price of getting that other you know system so i think if you are going to get into amps and dax and all that kind of stuff it should be based around power requirements it should be based around form factor it should be based around functions right and there are very good reasons to get the ifi devices for example because they have the base boost function and whatever else right all that stuff even on something like what's behind me, you can't see it right now, but it's in the thumbnail for this. Something like that, what you get with the SPL thing with, where it has the, the crossfeed. If you care about crossfeed, I don't. But like if you care about that, that's a reason to go for that, that kind of thing. Um, RME, the ADI2, there's so much you can do with that, you know, DAC. You know, that makes sense. <laughs> um, but the idea of, you know, getting something just for the output because you read somewhere that it is magic, I... I don't, I don't personally get that. Um, now, I, that doesn't mean that I don't think certain combinations sound great. I think they do sound great. I just don't think, think they sound proportionally different to how much the price difference is, if that makes sense. But that's where I'm at in my sort of path through the audiophile journey. Other people might be, might be you know walking down a, a different path, and that's fine. <laughs> Don't let my comments here denigrate your experiences. When you haven't used some headphones for a few years and they need to be printed again, <laughs> it definitely has cleaner bass. Okay. <laughs> Do you think a V-shaped tuning takes away? Uh, let's let's get into spicy hour now, guys. It's it is time for less spice. Do you think V-shaped tuning takes away from some clarity and texture and from the music? Uh, I could clearly listen to additional upper mid-range texture with U12T that Z1R wasn't able to reproduce. So I don't know about the last comparison there, but yeah, I do think I do think that V-shaped tunings are inferior to more neutral tunings or more balanced tunings because because like to me sound signature is like a sandwich and if it's just all base and trouble it's just bread with nothing there none of the ingredients and what makes a sandwich good is all the different ingredients that you have in the sandwich now not everybody feels that way i know people who well i know people who for who like i've taken them out to uh to lunch and and they weren't able to eat whatever thing it was because it had too many ingredients <laughs> And if you're watching the person who <laughs> you know who you are, <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite uh, thing, favorite favorite lines to remember. Uh, 
too many ingredients. But yeah, so like if you like that, that's fine. But I find I, you know, for my sandwiches, I want there to be lots of ingredients. There's an A90D tube model. That's cool. I want to check that out. See, that interests me, right? I don't care about any of the other sort of like A90 stuff, right? I don't care about, it's like, okay, well, you can, I bet this AAA1 sounds the same. I bet it does. <laughs> and it's like way less expensive, right? It doesn't have as much power, sure, but it's less expensive. And it drives just like most headphones just as good. Um, but yeah, the idea of an A90D tube amplifier, uh, cool. I don't know. <laughs> it's different, right? Yeah, like tube amplifiers, hybrids, like all that kind of stuff. There's They do have an effect. They do change the sound um, often. Um, and actually, you know, the interesting thing is... Yeah, the interesting thing about... Some, I'm just trying to can't remember which one it was. I think it's the Forge. Um the, the amps and sound forge when i measured so when i was comparing yeah i was comparing the euphoria measurements of headphones done on the euphoria so like i measured like an hd 100s and of hd 600 on the on the felix audio euphoria and then i did the same measurements on the forge like no change to the positioning on the headphone on the rig and on the euphoria there's very consistent you can see very very like clear second harmonic elevation um, like it's, it's at like negative 40 or something like that. Negative 60. Ne yeah, but it's definitely audible. And uh, that's what makes it to be with the forge. I could not tell, I could not see a measured difference in the distortion profile. Like, like there, yeah, it was, it was different cause it always is, but like the actual level of distortion, like on average was not higher. And I don't understand that. <laughs> so somebody can like, yeah, I'm sure the amplifier has harmonic distortion, right? It's a tube amp. Of course it does, but I could not. I couldn't see it translated, you know, the effect, I couldn't see it measured in the headphone. It sounds very different from, you know, solid state sources, but I couldn't actually see the measured effect. So I don't know. That's interesting. Or it's either that or like, it's so subtle, you know, like that my, you know, I wasn't able to like analyze the distortion profile to a sufficient degree. I don't know. DACs make a minor difference, but you got to spend the big bucks. Amps make a huge difference with some headphones. Well, if you're not driving them properly, I would agree. Like if they need more power, yes, <laughs> definitely. Addition XS plus iFi True Bass is amazing. Yeah, it's probably a great combination for those not in the EQ gang. Yeah, I think it's great. What do you think of topping DAX and amps? Yeah, basically, basically what I said. Um, I didn't like the A90 because it had the ground loop issue. I'm not going to comment on the sound. <laughs> um, but I think they fixed that with A90D, right? So that's better. More isn't better. More what? Hey, what's up, Super? Good to see you. I'm more of a bright sticks guy at the fancy restaurants. <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just all bass and all treble. Like the the frequencies from like two hundred hertz to like five K are all just like dropped. <laughs> They're just gone. <laughs> uh, Media versus SA six summary. Ooh. What's warmer? Ah uh, SA six is warmer. Uh, like it's hard to really yeah. Meteor is the one that sounds like more f exciting, more fun. The bass is really good on the Meteor. SA6 is the one where it's like, it's more just this warm, relaxed kind of euphonic thing where it doesn't immediately grab your attention and stand out, but then like over time you really start to appreciate that about it. I, I hope that helps. I don't know. That's kind of how I would describe it, but they're both like, yeah, a ton of fun. Um, it's not my most hated amp. I think amps that explode are my most hated amps. Uh, what there was wasn't there? There was also one from. I feel like it was like one of the past labs amps that was also really bad. Um, I could be just making that pulling that out of the thin air, but we did a simulating amplifier distortion uh, article uh, that uh, Blaine put together, and uh, like he put together the the actual like simulations, and uh, the past labs one was definitely audible for the distortion. 
or like it was the example was now whether it be audible with music is a good question <laughs> If I remember correctly, we did actually put music, like simulated music with that distortion profile in there, if I remember correctly. But that's why that amplifier comes to mind. Um, what is, okay. That's a sound mode. SMSL and topping have, have it in their more expensive solid state sources but it's still solid state. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, but still, okay, I, I get what you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know what you mean then. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember there was there was that in the S, in the SMSL one that I evaluated too. Um, yeah, that's not, it's a simulated thing, yeah. But I, I still think that's cool, right? I still think it's like, they're giving you something that maybe you might like, because it actually is going to change the sound rather than just stuff that sounds identical across the board so i think that's cool that's what's cool about those smsls and, and, and toppings if they're doing that i don't know what top i don't know i haven't tried one the topping one that does that but the smsl one did so that's cool um after proper abx test good implement good implemented dax and amps sound the same i think it's more i think it's a bit more complicated than that because what like because then if, if you were to rule out like any sort of tube amp right that is a missing the forest for the trees problem that you know exists in audio in general um you know because people like tube amps right <laughs> like um uh, now not ever, maybe there's a certain split some maybe more people like solid state right um uh, i think there's a good argument for that but you know um the idea of good implemented is a difficult one to sort of like, you know, hand wave with a blanket statement. Um, but AVX testing does reveal lots of things that you didn't realize before. I, I said this before, I don't think we should over value AVX testing, but I think it's a good thing to include in evaluations. Um, you know, when you're, when you're going through the reason I say this is because because of how bad auditory memory is. Um, but I don't think it's like a sufficient thing to just say, I did an ABX, done. Like, it's not it's not that simple. I don't know anything about Culver's Rubier. Um, it's more fun to have a bunch of budget IEMs than two expensive ones. Depends on the budget ones and the expensive ones. DAC is more important than AMP. Source matters. <laughs> That's not what I'm going to like disagree with because there's, that is like, that, that is a can of worms. <laughs> um... What am I missing out on the thousand dollar plus headphones compared to the Sundara? Depends on the headphones, um, but in good versions of that, um, yeah, there's a lot. Like just comparing again, HE one thousand V two to the Sundara EQ to the ex to basically an identical result, so different. Um, and I think it is t due to whatever's going on with the diaphragm here. I think that's that. That's the difference. Um, but what are you missing out on as far as the experience is concerned? Um, I, I don't know. It sounds more like the big thing for me when I make that comparison is that it sounds like you're getting more depth out of your music. You can hear the instruments or whatever, whatever is coming through in the music more clearly for those individual lines, right? Whether it's a vocal harmony or, or something else, like that is a more clear presentation of, of whatever that line is. Whereas on lower end headphones, they often tend to kind of blend a little bit more. That's the biggest thing. That's what I, you know, when I, th when I think of what is good in, you know, audio experiences, it's, it's things that are more in, in that direction, if that makes sense. The, the separated and distinct and clear presentations for things. Um, you know, Tile called this hearing into the music <laughs> um, or you know identifying finer little nuances in the music and that's really for me the thing that you know the higher end headphones do better not always but sometimes but can you know 
I think that's why you see the trends that you do though as well. Um, like on Critical's ranking list, for example. It's not always the case. Like you have headphones that are more expensive that are, you know, not as good for those qualities. Like I'm thinking of the, like the Expanse, for example, right? It's definitely not on the level of the, of this um, for that. But, um, or some just, you know, uh, the Empyrean or the Elite, right? They're more expensive, but they, you know, just because they're more expensive, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily better than the less expensive ones. But they're, can be more expensive headphones that are also better. Didn't you at one point agree that something like a Rebel Amp sounded notably different from the A90? Speaking in terms of dynamics and intangibles. Uh, I'll need to do, th I want, that's one of the ones that I still have on my radar to ABX. I didn't actually do that ABX. I did the ABX with the Magni Heresy and the A90 and found no difference. And then I also did that comparison with the, I want to say the RME and the Vioelectric and found there was no difference. Now, um, that also is with, I don't remember the headphones I was using, but it was with one pair of headphones. So it could be that with different headphones, you find, you know, again, the headphones are a confounding variable. <laughs> so if you're running, you know, certain like certain headphones that don't really, you know, have a perfectly linear impedance curve, for example, and you, you know, you're swapping sources, maybe you won't find a difference. But then there are other sources or other headphones where you have you don't have a linear impedance curve, uh, and you run it off of a high input output impedance source, and suddenly you get more bass, right? There's those types of things happen. Um, but in those examples that I was ABX testing, I, you know, it was like. I wouldn't be able to, you know, reliably get the right answer, if that makes sense. So, yeah, the Rebel Amp is one that I want to try. I mean, the Rebel Amp, the topology is very different. Um, so I think that'd be cool to do with the A90. Um, it's probably next on my list to do. But I also have, like, there's some really high-end expensive stuff that I want to try <laughs> um, and compare it with, like, some of the more budget stuff. I think that's a cool video, right, to do, like... Um, I mean, I think it's a more fun video than two mid-level amps, you know, battling it out. Um, yeah. Would you would you spend four hundred dollars plus on an amp? Yeah, personally, I would. Yeah, if it's the right, if it has the right form factor, the right amount of power for what I want to drive, the right type of technology for what it is that I'm trying to do, uh, the if it has functions that I find valuable, yeah, absolutely. Um, but you guys know, like, wh what, what do I use for my, uh, <laughs> like, personal use? It's not the expensive stuff. Um, it's, you know, I, obviously, I would, you know, the expensive stuff is nice, but I just don't find that there's a proportional difference. And it, you know what it is? I think it's like, at a certain point, things stop becoming better. They just become different. Um, like is is a tube is a high end tube amp necessarily better than a high end solid state amp? Well, well, no, or even like a mid level solid state amp. You know, no, it's just different. But that different might difference might be important to people. Um, you know, so yeah. Moondrip. Kado versus Truthier Hexa. Um, it's a good question. I think the Kado sounds more normal, but the Hexa sounds more exciting in the treble. But the, the, yeah, the Kado is one where I think it is a little more balanced overall. Um, the Hexa is just a little bit bright. It's just, yeah. Um, but for technicalities, man, like the Hexa is really freaking good. <laughs> um, yeah, it's and I actually like. I prefer the way that the upper mid range is handled on the hexa that's a spicy take but i don't yeah that's why i don't use a kato <laughs> what's your abx hardware switcher look like uh, i did I, there's a video on the channel that that I, where i point at it uh it's the one where i was setting up the new lab um eventually we'll need to move away from that space though because it's too noisy for uh filming videos but um but um yeah it's right now just a PCB. <laughs> it's not. It's not even a box. People pay thousands of dollars to get two amp distortion. Sure, you sure you could get the same with good DSP. Um, 
so in my experience, no. In my experience, there's I have never heard a solid state piece of equipment sound the way that a tube, you know, the hybrids, yes, solid state and hybrids pretty close, but but uh, oh, I don't know if I want to say you know categorically yes, but it's with it's closer within the ballpark there, you know if they're if they're if they're doing things like rolling off the base or the treble or something like that, you can definitely do that with DSP, but I've never heard DSP in solid state be able to perfectly replicate what you get with tubes. Um, now again, personally. Most of my listening is through solid state. <laughs> like, I'm a solid state kind of guy. I like, you know, solid state and planars. I like solid state HD 600s. I like that kind of thing, right? But I also enjoy, you know, running it off of tube amps, you know, every once in a while. Get a little bit of that, you know, flavor in there. It's good fun. I would love to ABX test one day, even comparing similarly priced amps with the Jot 2 and Rebel Amp. Yeah, like, okay, so this is the thing, right, with the ABX testing. It's like, yeah, that, this is why, like, I don't think ABX testing is a sufficient thing, right? Because, yeah, you might find, like, pe a person who spends a lot of time with something and comparing things is probably going to have a better sense of, you know, what those things are than if you're just, you know, 15 minutes of going back and forth with the <laughs> ABX tester, right? Um, but you know, um, it doesn't mean that those two things are incompatible, right? It doesn't mean that, that, you know, um, s statements about long-term listening and, sh you know, short-term ABX testing are, uh, that doesn't mean they need to point to the same thing necessarily, right? You can just decide what is, you know, there's a bit of a dualism there, right? I think it's fine. Um, the thing that kind of gets to me though, is that like, if you're spending a lot of time with, one amplifier and then you're like all right i'm gonna say you have like the shit magni heresy right and you're like oh yeah i'm really into this and then you're moving over to the other one other amplifier and you'd say it's a you know say it's a rebel amp and you're like oh but this one has you know this kind of sound character or whatever and you're getting super deep into like the differences in sound character and then you find that with an abx you swap it over you go and and you're like a true abx where you find the results you were only like you weren't able to get the answer you weren't able to to select you know the right one um more than 50 percent of the time well that kind of tells you that there's something else going on you know psychoacoustically or you know whatever else right when you're doing these these reports right um and and the, and the thing is it doesn't mean that like we should discount that it's definitely a part of it but like it doesn't it's not necessarily something that has to do with the the, the physics going on <laughs> um so yeah that's why that's also why like after i started doing that like i was i'm just like i'm never gonna go deep into this like you know let's wax poetic about you know the subjective intangible qualities of solid state amplifiers um, except in cases where there actually is a tangible difference that you can find when you do this sort of ABX testing, because there are going to be, you know, differences that you find. And again, this goes back to what I was saying before, differences that you should expect based on what, based on the design of the topology, the measurements, all the actual stuff, right? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> And of course, tube amps. Yeah, that's another thing entirely. That's where all those subjective things, you know, it's like, yeah, what else? How else are we going to, yeah, I'm going to point at, you know, this is where the third harmonic distortion is a little bit higher than the second harmonic. Like, that, that that's not something that normal humans can make sense of. <laughs> yeah, you were gushing over the Fidelis RNDAC impressions. Oh, it was just because it was all on my channels, my old channels, why I deleted them. Um, yeah, uh, so I didn't do an ABX with that one, right? So uh, it is very possible that I could have been uh, wrong about that one, it turns out. Um, also, another key variable there is volume. This is something that I think that a lot of folks kind of uh, discount, is the effects of volume on um, preference. Um, and and this is why, like, when you're doing your... the even if you're not doing like ABX testing, but you're doing like comparisons with um, two different sources, if you are not perfectly level matched, you can have 
it's going to you know skew your preference towards the one that's louder it's it, yeah and so that's entirely possible to happen as well right so this is why like like i don't i don't want to over inflate the importance of abx but i think it is something that's important to include if you can um <laughs> louder equals more detail true fact yeah <laughs> So here's what I want to do, right? And again, I'm, this is why it was, you, I think, Chris, you're missing the point there a little bit, right? I haven't done the ABX with that one. What I want to do, though, is like ABX testing with the high-end gear and then the, the low-end gear, right? Like the the Magni 3 Heresy and the, like, say the Magni 3 Heresy and the RNDAC, right? So doing an ABX with that, I think, would be fascinating to do. Um, and then publish the results, right? Or, you know, uh what's the other JDS versus the Lena stack, <laughs> right? Or we have the, um, we have the HE 1000, sorry, EF 1000, um, hybrid tube amplifier, pardon me, from hi Man, which is like 15 grand or something crazy, right? That's one I want to do because it's like, you know, I, that's one where I actually, I really would expect there to be a difference because it is a hybrid design. And so for certain types of headphones, I think you would probably find a difference. But the question on my mind with that is like, okay, how significant is that difference, right? If we're volume matched and we're doing this ABX, like, is this a difference that enough where I care $15,000 worth? Um, I don't, yeah, like maybe it will. Maybe like I'll use this as Vara, right? Like I'll try that because it's like a high-end headphone. And um, yeah, I... I think it'd be fascinating. I'd love to publish the results. It might be a little bit heartbreaking for some folks, but here's the other thing. I'm also just one person with one set of ears. Like maybe somebody else is able to score better, you know? Um, or maybe we find that there are, maybe I am reliably able to get the right answer. <laughs> so yeah, I haven't done, my point I guess is that I haven't really done enough ABX testing on th specifically that, you know, like the high end versus the low end. So that's, when I do publish a video on ABX tested sources, it's gonna be that. Placebo in a way is actually desirable for the headphone experience. Reviews slash sound descriptions can be a good source of good placebo. Yeah, if you're gonna just like bite that bullet, <laughs> if you're just gonna, or I guess drink the Kool-Aid, then it's like, hell yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, and this is actually a, an interesting thing, you know, if, if whatever framing effects lead you to have a better experience with a piece of source equipment, regardless of whether or not it's actually making a physical difference, if you, if you, are, uh, if you are identifying things and enjoying it more, it becomes a distinction without a difference um, to that person. Now, for people making purchase decisions, yeah, I mean, it probably is a thing you, you want to you know, select against, but cause then you can maybe get more for your money. That's I think pretty straightforward, but you know, I don't think, I mean, you guys are, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. I'm pretty sure you guys are mostly on the same page here, but like if, if the story around a piece of source equipment is what leads a person to have a better experience, power to them, you know, um, <laughs> that's, it's fine. <laughs> No pun intended. <laughs> I'm not going to review the seventh acoustic supernova, but uh, Precog did. It's up on the on the website. I'm not sure about the subtonic storm. What's your idea of implementing DSP with wired IEM? Like, can we drop quarks? I am not familiar with that question, but I don't see why not. There's nothing wrong with DSP and wired IEMs or wireless. <laughs> I, uh, for those planars, although like timeless and whatever else, like, yeah, I was doing that <laughs> manually, of course. Yeah, Felix Envy uh, is dope. Uh, that's probably my favorite tube amp right now that I heard with the Susvara specifically, but yeah. I, that's one I'm not able to steal off of Taryn's desk. <laughs> or I could try, I guess. Um, uh, 
Do you have any insights into how much volume changes the frequency curve? It, it generally doesn't. The only times it does is if, so sometimes like with those wireless, um, like the Apple AirPods Pro 2 and some of those ones, um, they actually do have um, attenuation uh, in the base and the treble, depending on you know how loud it is. Um, so yeah, uh, in those situations, uh, volume has an effect on frequency response, but otherwise it does not. Or unless you go like up to the max SPL and like something weird happens with the driver, <laughs> then yeah. But within like, you know, normal listening ranges, or, you know, even up to like 100, uh, 100 dB, even, even higher than that, that doesn't change for most headphones. A Source ABX booth at an audio show set up as a challenge for customers, manufacturers could be devastating. Yeah, it could be. It's a great idea, though. <laughs> that is a really cool idea. I mean, it could be devastating, but it could also be revealing, depending on which sources it's hooked up to. If you have a source that you're like, yeah, this is going to sound better to people, and we're going to, like, say it's even like a tube amp, right? See, okay, even within solid state sources, there are differences that are going to affect headphones, right? So, like, and there are multiple different types of differences. But let's just use the tube versus solid state example because it's a more strong one. It's a clearer one. If you had a, you know, crazy tube amp set up and you had like a, you know, I don't know, topping L30 or something and you had the ABX, right, you could kind of reveal the differences that the tube amp made and um, and kind of show people, yeah, this is, this is what that difference is for you in the music. I think it'd be really cool. So yes, it could be devastating depend if it's like, you know, two amps that are basically the same, like if you hooked up a, you know, a topping to a, you know, SMSL or whatever, like if you compared those or, or even like, you know, lower end, like a Magni Heresy versus an A90, right? People wouldn't hear a difference. <laughs> Uh, more money spent yeah is a placebo <laughs> yeah I want to see the headphone amp comparison high end versus low end yeah that's in my at least in my mind right like maybe there's a reason to do the mid range stuff too but at least in my mind I think the cooler thing is like I and I have obviously I have assumptions with how that's going to shake out right I think it's going to be that like there are some comparisons where the difference matters and it's again to the differences that we should expect and there are others where it's not going to matter at all and you can't like where you can't even you know identify the result and that, the other thing is for those videos it can't just be me it has to be also like other people who are who are you know listening for because when i'm listening for stuff i have my way of listening you know to the th to certain particular things to judge good or bad, you know, better or worse, right? I'm not talking about like amplifiers, particularly like headphones. Just in general, the way I listen is one way of listening. But other people listen in different ways, right? What they pay attention to could be different. So I think it has to include more than just me. Silver cables sound brighter, black cables sound darker, red cables sound warmer. <laughs> I have you missed it, but had a, had a large, thick boy copper cable that actually made a difference in SPL. Um, do this with the cables at CanJam, the cable booths alongside. <laughs> I see, I don't have an ABX for cables because as soon as you start doing that, then, then cable, cable believers <laughs> are going to goalpost shift on you. They're going to be like, oh yeah, but that's running through your ABX. And so that's coloring the sound. No, but see, I even made that mistake, right? Like I made the mistake when I went to, when I just recently at uh, CanGem SoCal, right? I walked in, uh, was, um, I think it was Golden and Skedra were telling me, uh, they're like, this cable makes a difference. And Skedra is the, is the guy who makes the cables. Um, and he's telling me, this cable makes a difference. And I walked into that being like, 
I don't believe it. I'm not going to hear a difference. Like these are all we're all in good, you know, faith, like good natured, you know, people. Right. But, um, but they were like, yeah, like you, you will hear it guaranteed. And so I approached it with this kind of like skepticism as a, as someone who is like not taken by a lot of that stuff. Right. And at first when I, when I put the headphones on with the, cause I did the, I did the, like the default cable first and then I put the other cable on, put the headphones on and then I was so sure of myself. I was like, yeah, like, no, there's, there's no, I was about to be like, oh, I can't hear a difference. And then I was like, wait a second, <laughs> this one is louder and warmer. <laughs> what the hell's going on? So I got them to send it to me uh, and to measure. And sure enough, it's about six dB louder across the entire frequency spectrum. And it is also warmer. The upper trouble is reduced. So it's like, okay, yeah, there are some situations where where it does make a difference. Um, is it going to matter for 99% of people? No. And so, yeah, there's more to it than just uh, someone. I see someone here says religion. It's more to it than just religion versus atheism. It's uh, there are there are tangible, measurable things <laughs> with some of this stuff. But I don't know the way I look at it too. Though is like even in those situations where like you have this particularly esoteric setup system where you have a cable that does make a difference because the headphones are you know no impedance or extremely low impedance or whatever right and say that there is a you know measurable difference i don't know that i would i would not be compelled to make a purchase if it's something i could just eq but that's just me um I still don't, I don't think that as a reviewer, I can expect people to EQ because I know they won't, <laughs> but how I personally use this stuff. No, I, of course I EQ. I take my sound quality seriously. <laughs> Do you not EQ? <laughs> no, I don't expect people to. Yeah. So like another great example to try with ABX would be with the Zale amp. I don't know if I'll be able to get one of those in because those are really expensive. But yeah, um, trying that against a L30, I don't know, <laughs> that'd be cool, right? You felt nauseated and weak after the shock? What shock? Water heater? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what DB do you listen at and why? I tested this recently, it's in the 70s. Um, yeah, I was kind of surprised. Um, it, I mean, like the, the average was maybe like 75 Yeah, for, for what I felt was like enjoyable. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't reach for the knob to crank it up. Right. Um, I was like, all right, I mean, I'm, I'm digging the music, I'm into it. And then I, I tested it on the rig to figure out how loud that actually was in an FFT and it was around 75 ish. So, which is interesting because if I took that same volume and did a, did like a sweep, it would be louder. So Yeah. Oftentimes the, what we're testing for, what we're like measuring the test tones is louder than what you actually listen to music at. All right. Um, uh, Tyson, did you use an ABX in that comparison? Cause if you did, I would love to see the results. Cause that would be, you should publish that. Um, yeah, like I think uh, <laughs> this has turned into the amp DAC discussion again. Um, I don't want people to misunderstand, you know, that like, Oh, an ABX reveals that there's no difference, like period might as well be using an Apple dongle. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that the ABX revealed that on sources where there wasn't a reason to think that there might be a difference in terms of topology, in terms of the design, like the, the measured results or anything like that, it revealed that there's no difference there, right? Um, the measured results were for just noise and distortion were, you know, low enough on both to where they're inaudible. So, you know, that was there a difference. No, right. But there are other 
there are other comparisons to make where uh, you are going to find a difference, like guaranteed, depending on what, depending on what your the rest of the setup is. Um, so yeah, uh, and and I actually think that there has been a positive blind test ABX. I think that one that there was one that Golden did, um, where he found he was able to reliably get get the difference among two different sources. I I think it was Dax though, not Amps. I'll have to have him on and ask him what that was. Because, yeah, he also has an ABX. So there's a couple of us who are doing ABX testing with this stuff. And, um, yeah, um, so so I, I think we probably have a slightly different, uh, you know, opinion on on kind of, like, what's worth it. <laughs> but, but uh, or, like, you know, I actually don't even know I should ask him. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Um, but, um, yeah, he was able to find a difference in the ABX that he did. So that's cool. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's get some more spicy takes here, guys. The problem with ABX, it's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Wait, super, do you have ABX? Do you not ABX, bro? <laughs> do you even ABX? That's how, that's how all these are going to go. Yeah, Chris, he's I, he has one. Yeah, I, or maybe the stream is delayed, but he he's he has a positive he has a positive finding, which is cool. Are there some headphones that cannot be saved with EQ? Yes. Yeah, Tyson, if you don't ABX this, your auditory memory is not good enough to be able to make that kind of call. I Are you talking like two different units, one with this cable and one with another cable? Because unless it's because that creates additional confounding variables because unit variation is bound to be a thing, right? And that actually has a much bigger effect than like if you were to measure that same headphone with two cables, it would measure the same. Unless, like, as long as the coupling is the same. Unless we're talking about a situation like the one that I tested, you know, before. Like, if the headphones were in one of those, like, root, like, in this case, it was a ribbon headphone, right? So, like, a, a no impedance situation, very low impedance situation. Let's go. More spicy takes, guys. I'll go for another 15 minutes here, and we'll, but it's, it's spicy hour. That's what we're going to focus on. Even though I think the <laughs> apps and tax conversation has been spicy. I probably wouldn't run the HE1000 off the QLX 5K. I haven't tested that, so I don't know. But use the power calculator. Um, or Google power cal headphone power calculator. If you want to try cable for your IAMs that will without a doubt change the sound signature, then try to get your hands on a, l oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, you could, you can even design a cable with a passive filter in it if you wanted to. <laughs> that would make a difference. Or like some sort of, um, like an impedance adapter or something like that. They, they can have an effect. Measurable. All right, I'll be talk. Uh, Moondrop Aria isn't great at its current price in today's market, even though it's not that old. My only complaint there with those is like something in the treble is just not quite right. And it is something that the Hexa actually does better. I don't know if you agree, but yeah. Spicy take, you need a measurement site. Can you like... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Mr. Squigglink himself asking me to post stuff on Squigglink. <laughs> There's stuff. There's stuff that that we're working on behind the scenes to help with the representation of uh, information. Let's just put it that way, and that isn't going to be out for a while, but is being worked on. 
Because, like, the thing that I find a lot of the time is, like, folks ask me, f like, every day, you know, can you compare this measurement of this headphone to that headphone? And while I've done the measurements of them, I don't have specifically the comparison that people are looking for. So the comparison aspect is super important. Developing new headphones is relatively pointless compared to developing new ways to do personalized EQ, which would do so much more. I kind of disagree. I mean, I I see why you say that. And I think there's a sense in which that's right. But the, the bigger thing, though, is that you can't convince normal people to do EQ. You just can't. And I bet you, like there's people in this chat who you can't convince to do EQ. So, or that EQ is, is, is a good thing or, or that there's something that, you know, if done, like that no matter what, you know, they, people think no matter what, there's always something lost when you do it. Right. So like, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not getting into that debate, right. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I'm just saying like the bigger challenge for that idea is the, the purchase that you need to get with the masses in order for that to gain any sort of traction, right? Like that there's a sense in which like when headphone manufacturers are developing a headphone, they are literally just trying to get it to, you know, uh, get the sound signature to be one that they think is the right one. And you could totally just get that with EQ, <laughs> right? Um, if you wanted to, but I think, I think it's like, you can't, because I, even I can, even among this audience here, like among you guys, I can't expect you guys to do EQ. I, I know that's not going to happen. And so I can't purely base my judgments on whether or not something is good on, on, you know, what I do with it. Right. It, I, it has to be like, okay, for the, you know, we need two different kind of, you know, uh, potential recommendations. There's the recommendation for EQ gang. And then there's a recommendation for everybody else, you know, the rest of the people out there. And, um, it turns out that, you know, EQ gang can, 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 uh, enjoy far more headphones <laughs> than, uh, you know, than the rest, but still it's like, I, I would, I don't think we should, I think here, okay, this is my, like, it's not a spicy take, but this is my sort of like view of the industry. When, when we're talking about like high end headphones, like thousand dollar plus, you should never expect people. Like if you're spending that kind of money, you know, you shouldn't ask people to EQ, right? It should be good enough for the tuning. The difference is that people who are spending that kind of money, thousand dollars plus on headphones are going to be usually or often more picky about sound quality than people who are spending a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars on sound quality and so there is a chance that if they listen to one of these right or say well that actually is fairly okay for its tuning right it's decent but say i don't know an lcd5 right there's a, there's a chance that an lcd5 is going to match more closely with somebody's hrtf um, than like like more specifically or Utopia, Utopia is a great example. Um, you know, that's something perfectly perfectly matching the smoothness of Harmon because I would argue that would be bad. <laughs> like I wouldn't want to listen to something that is you know perfectly you know to the smooth Harmon target or any smooth target because we actually it, like if you look at what an actual HRTF looks like, it's like it's not that. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's go. More spicy takes. Any IAM that costs more than two hundred dollars is a ripoff, unless it's made of gold. <laughs> I disagree. I I think because of what we just talked about with sound signature, right? If you're not expecting people to EQ, there's just so many different flavors and potential tunings that are going to fit people differently, you know, or suit people differently. Um, that's exactly why it should be made easy enough that people can just try it for a moment. Yeah. And credit to Odyssey for the reveal plus, because I think that is a step towards what you're kind of talking about there. I think, um, where they don't actually need to do the EQ. They just need to turn on a plugin. I think that's a, 
I think that's a cool way of um, approaching it. EQ is a skill that needs to be learned and ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, this is what I was just saying, yes. <laughs> a lot of anti-EQ people will try to EQ, do it wrong and think EQ sucks and just ruins quality. Exactly, exactly. This is, this is kind of like at the crux of that debate um, that it is a, it's a time consuming, you know, process. And there are so many different ways that you can mess things up. Um, and if you're not doing it by ear, you know, if you're doing it to a graph, there's, there's a good chance you can mess like that, that result is also going to be messed up. Um, so it, it is why I don't think I, we should expect that. But if you want to get the most out of your, out of your headphones, of course, of course you dive in. <laughs> EQ stuff's the need to own more than one headphone. Uh, there are things that I'm not able to affect with EQ. Like, for example, I can never get the HE1000 V2 to sound like a Utopia. No matter what I do, it just doesn't. No, like, you can turn the bass to the maximum with this. It still will not sound as punchy as a Utopia. It's not, so there are some intangible qualities here that, again, I point to, you know, diaphragm material, driver type, that kind of thing that I just can't see it in the graph um, that you can't make it sound like that. So, And I think vice versa. I don't think you can make a Utopia sound like an HE1000 V2. <laughs> I don't know what that, I don't know what that means, Rob. But so here's the thing, right? Like the mission that I would be on, right? Like, right, like as a kind of like as a whole would be to try and push towards headphones getting released that don't really require EQ at all, right? Where like, even if there's something where you're like, I, I prefer something that is a little bassier, a little bit more treble or whatever, right? That's fine. But that the fine grain stuff is reasonably balanced and reasonably, you know, it has a, you know, ear game shape to it to some degree right i feel i feel like like that's that's kind of like my function in this industry is like to make sure that like this i mean if i had if if i have any influence on you know or put any ability to put pressure on on, on manufacturers it would be to do that so this it's like the headphones that you like the headphones that get sold at high price tags are still reasonably tuned right <laughs> And uh, for whatever, and then whatever choices they want to make beyond that, it doesn't need to be Harmon, right? It doesn't need to be Harmon is just, it's, it's just, you know, one type of preference research that's done. It's great research. I love it. I use it all the time, but it's not something where it needs to match or anything. It sh probably shouldn't even. But at the same time, it's like, I want, uh, it, I would love it if we could just push the industry in the direction of, you know, no EQ required. And if you do want to do it, it's just because it's a preference thing and you want more bass. Add a bass shelf or reduce the bass or more treble. Like, simple filters and done. <laughs> it's my mission statement. Because I... Okay, I mean, some of you guys, many of you guys know about, you know, the benefits of EQ. But I would never expect that of people. Sindara techs are meh. Totally agree. Like, I think they're they're good at the price tag. I just don't... I don't think they're you know meaningfully better than they're they're they are very good at instrument separation at the price tag they are good at that but um they are not better than they don't go up to like you know lcd 2f level or something like that like there's a pretty clear difference i think even like other stuff within that range i think that they are slightly better than that of the aeon aeon closed but that's that's about as high as I think they would go. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's a well-tuned headphone with, you know, decent technical performance. Um, planar, control during busy passages. It has the text that some people care about. But I would agree with you that they are not killing any giants. I feel like there's a lack, is a lack of assessments for reliability, such consistency for product reviews. There's a reason for that. 
and it's because when if like as a any headphone reviewer kind of knows this like if you get a product in and you say you even say even you have like a month with it right that's often not when the problems are going to show up <laughs> so uh if you have a long like a year along with something right and i think that's a much better indicator of you know reliability consistency though is a thing that um like for like you know unit variation and stuff like that that's a thing that um we do test actually um and uh yeah i i want to get to a point where i can like kind of um indicate a unit consistency score but again how do you do that without having multiple units right so for reviewers you, you kind of got to review what's in front of you and if there's nothing wrong with it <laughs> you know um you can't really fault it um at the same time like there's definitely like you know that there are reports of driver failures and whatever else with given brands and you, like everybody knows that that is going on and, and sometimes it's worth commenting on that if it's a common trend but you can't know that that's going to happen with that unit that you have in front of you so that's why actually with um like the a good example of this is the road nth 100 i had that in and it felt really solid and sturdy but then it came out like a few months later that like the side part of the headband kept cracking on people right so that was a failure point that in my review cycle, I had no way of knowing about. <laughs> if you could only own headphones from one brand, what would it be? Sennheiser. Well, okay. Mm. Uh, only own headphones from one brand. It depends what you mean by that. If you mean by like, of the headphones that are available on the market, and you had to pick one brand that was the brand that you could only own headphones from. That's a tough question. If the question is, if there was, if your favorite brand could make all your favorite headphones, <laughs> or if one brand could make all your favorite headphones, what would that brand be? The answer for me is Sennheiser. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, if it's the former question, that's a tough one. I probably lean Hi-Fi Man, probably. That's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, Hi-Fi Man or Odyssey, I think maybe. I like planners. What can I say? It's uh, it's fun. The reason I say Sennheiser though is because they have a history of making extremely well-engineered um, headphones, like the. Say whatever you want about some of the duds like the HD820 and the HD700, some of the ones that were not well received. They make really well engineered headphones, have very tight tolerances. Their QC is great, um, generally. Um, and uh, they make, in my view, sensible products. So it's like if I could apply that lens to, you know, my favorite headphones, they would all have that kind of, you know, uh, process behind them. I think that would be great. EQ by ear is harder than learning to play the violin at a professional level. Really? I don't know about that. Impossible for most, it seems, unless you can brute force it somehow. I kind of don't know about it. I think it takes a little bit of effort initially to get to a point where you can, you know, you have an easier sense of, and you know what to do, right? I, I think the mistake would be trying to do that just with music, but I think you can do it. Um... So yeah, I think I, I don't think it's it's like once you once you've figured out that process, then doing it for other headphones I think is it's easier. Right, I'm gonna skip a bit. Let's get to the spicy stuff here. Just a, just a couple more. Cost is the answer to the one brand question. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Sennheiser should make burgers. I would love to bun some. <laughs> okay. What type of headphones EQ better, dynamic plane or electrostatic? Well, it's either plane or electrostatic. Depends on the headphones. Because I've had electrostatic headphones that actually do have higher harmonic distortion as well. So it depends. But I would say, yeah, plane R uh, or E-stat for sure. Uh...
In order to EQ well, a headphone needs to avoid time domain errors like resonances and have low distortion and a smooth FR. That matters more. Why? Here's a question, right? That's prompted by that. Why do we keep saying, why do we keep seeing folks take on the idea that, or run with the idea that time domain stuff is something we need to worry about as far as metrics is concerned? Because, like, I'm, I, <laughs> maybe it's folks who are new to this channel, maybe. I'm not not saying this just a single yo, but, like, it feels like every time we do we do these live streams, or not just this, but, like, even in the Discord, I'm noticing it. It feels like every time we, we get these, or all the time we get these questions about, like, you know, um, time domain stuff, CSD waterfall plots. Um... Because yeah, that's stuff that is is literally just frequency response. That's predictive. You can predict it from frequency response. Uh, frequency response is the better view of that same information. Um, same with square wave. It's the frequency response is the better view of that information. Um, of that same information. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know why. I feel like like we see a there's a there's a common trend in it's a good trend in uh you know sort of the public uh commentary on what contributes to good sound quality being focused more on frequency response i think that's a good thing but i don't see that same trend when it comes to metrics that are less valuable or not valuable or show the same stuff <laughs> i don't i don't get that uh, maybe someone could fill me in why people still think csd is important it to be clear it is important in situations well if you have excess group delay or something is something is really weird or broken with the driver or, or the way it's implemented, you know, um, then that might um, be an issue. But you think it's because your ears don't agree with what you're saying. It's not about what I'm saying. It's it has nothing to do with what I'm saying. It's that literally what the calculation is. <laughs> right. It has to do with four ear. It's, it's nothing to do with my it's not an opinion. <laughs> this is just a this is a simple calculation. And. And all you have to do to demonstrate this is with the measurement rig. People with a measurement rig can demonstrate this. You just find the thing that's showing your ringing in CSD, EQ that, and the ringing goes away completely, gone. It's a thing that is predictable. Headphones are minimum phase, and you can predict the CSD from frequency response. That it took me a while. I was I was totally on board with that first, Chris. Like I was like in your. I was thinking about it that that way because it looks like it is something it looks like it's something in addition to frequency response right that's kind of what that view does but um when you understand what what you're actually looking at a little bit more um and how that relates to how what like what that is it's um yeah uh, it, it took me a while to come around but i came around <laughs> And there's, yeah, there's so much information now out about, you know, the importance of CSD. Now, here's the thing, though, right? I would love it if I could say impulse response and CSD, those are important metrics because they contribute to the subjective aspects of sound or, or you know, um, um, other, just other metrics beyond frequency response. I would love it because then if, if, I, if I had something to actually explore, you know, beyond the frequency response, it would help make sense of, you know, the problem that I face, which is that, what oftentimes what I hear doesn't agree with the, or there's more to what I hear than what the graph shows. Right. Um, oftentimes. Yeah. But, um, but it ain't CSD. <laughs> what I think it is, is, is a difference of FR at the eardrum. And I, and I think that this is something that, you know, maybe with probe mics, you could, you could figure it out but but here's the thing even if it is fr the eardrum how do we know what's what contributes to good or better <laughs> or worse I, I don't know <laughs> i i can i can tell you almost with certainty that the biggest contributing factor is um is diaphragm material you know and we can talk about stiffness we can talk about compliance and all that kind of stuff but what the actual like being able to predict that from a measurement is still a mystery because yeah it's uh, certainly a measurement on a rig. I don't know about a measurement at a eardrum. That's why I want to explore that more. 
Hey, now, don't say anybody's ears are broken. Nobody's ears are broken. <laughs> that, this another thing is that in this in this hobby, right? Like, there are so many different ways for us to mislead ourselves, <laughs> or like, you know, like there are so many influences on us, even just like from something as like time of day, you know, like I don't know. Say you right before you were listening, you're walking, you know, down the street. Uh, to get to go home and a siren went by you know and it's like then you sit down to listen suddenly it's like ah oh, there's this like weird thing like it's there's so many different effects on on our you know perceptual faculties that it is very difficult to to like yeah you're bound to get inconsistencies you know even internal inconsistencies Um, what is the one thing you wish you could measure but cannot at the moment you mean I'm talking about like existing metrics pardon me um, I don't know if there's anything from existing metrics um, cause we do now measure impedance, um, maybe sensitivity, but I can do that too. Now it's just, I haven't done it. Um, but as far as intangible qualities, I wish I could measure things like, you know, the, the, the blunted bluntedness versus detail for trailing ends of tones. I, that is one thing I really wish I could measure because that would be really revealing. You tune your headphones to your audience. Vocal retuned the Utopia and people got mad. Megan has even stated that the OG Utopia was too bright and fatiguing. You have to have to know your audience. Hey, Chris. Hey, no way. No worries, man. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for hanging out. And you're always welcome, my dude. <laughs> Sass away. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't get it. I I understand perfectly why they retune the utopia i personally didn't have any issues with the original but you know this is an hrtf thing i think you know some for some people that where the resonance is they're like 6k or 8k uh i think maybe that's like fatiguing fatiguing for people and for other people it's totally fine um macrodynamics would be interesting to measure too yeah it would be yeah but resonances don't always show up as peaks on fr they can show up as dips and showing CSD helps people interpret the FR better. Well, okay, so if you have a headphone that is not minimum phase, right, in the sense that it is it breaks the proportionality ratio with frequency response in some way, you would see that in group delay. You would see that in excess group delay. And so you don't even need CSD to find that. Um, and I can tell you in all of the headphones that I've tested, <laughs> There, there hasn't been a single example of that. <laughs> I think the exception might be with well, no, even with the even with the Harmonicdyne G two hundred, which is based on the platform that is the M ten sixty driver, which is the famous example of that. Um, even on the G two hundred, it didn't have excess group delay, so there weren't any of those issues, even with that headphone. So it's a it, it's a very rare th rare thing if you if you come across it that there is that headphone is not minimum phase. I'm thinking of examples though, like there like I should test this on the RAL SR1A, right? To see because that's t that's not like a it doesn't couple, right? There's a it just sort of hangs there the ear speaker design. That would be cool. I'll I'll, I'll look into that because that could be fun. Um, but yeah, ordinary. It's not something we ha have any real reason to to worry about. Um, and maybe actually this is a compelling reason to publish, you know, the group delay results because then you can know whether or not that's something that you should care about. But I still think we need to get a, to a better like collective recognition of what's important and what's not from a metrological standpoint. Because um, yeah, it seems like people still have a lot of ideas about like even just the fact that people bring up square wave, even the fact that square wave has been a thing, right? Because Tile used to do square wave and he thought that that was an indication of something. But it, it wasn't. <laughs> it was an idea that got taken and, you know, misappropriated and then run with. Um, and I, and I, I didn't know that. I, I, I learned about it, like, basically the history of that, of that metric recently. 
and all it takes is is like once i've learned about that i was like wow that's um once i was educated on that topic i i i yeah realized like yeah there's kind of like what the, <laughs> what the hobby world has sort of done to, <laughs> to distort the value of certain metrics um but yeah I thought there was a couple of extra spicy takes here. R70X is underappreciated. Not many headphones around its price achieve its staging capabilities without making significant sacrifices to FR. That, I think, is a reasonable statement because you're right. It's It does have good stage and it doesn't have bizarro FR. I think it, it lacks a little bit in detail compared to some you know similarly priced stuff. Like, I think Sundara and 6XX are more detailed. Um, but yeah, for staging, it's quite good. A lot of people are looking for more bass in their equipment are... A lot of the people looking for more bass in their equipment are coping. Their music has been... Has bad bass. They need better music, not equipment. Oh, you are... You are reaching deep into the spice jar, my friend. <laughs> cheers. Cheers, Hobby Talk. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> I am never going to... So, I understand why you say that, but I am never going to tell people that their music sucks because I think everybody's music sucks. <laughs> so, you know, within the landscape of, like, you know, good and bad music, um, I live in a very... I live in, you know, a very small corner of that landscape, right? And and for me, that's a that's a peak, but... And everything else is just a valley. <laughs> but uh, But because of that, like, who am I to say that, you know mumble rap is terrible okay mumble rap is terrible i'm just gonna say it that's <laughs> call that a spicy take <laughs> um yeah we need to do we're actually working on an faq um on for the website there's there's a lot of um Actually, there's a lot of articles on the website right now that go into some of this stuff. It's just that they need to be updated. Um, like I wrote an article, I've written several articles a long time ago that was like how about how to read frequency response and how frequency response contributes to sound signature, all that kind of stuff. And I need to put it in a more accessible format, an accessible place, I think. So that is coming down the pipe soon. Mumble rap is an interesting example. I don't listen to it, but there is a ton of hip hop that has awful, awful bass, and there's a ton that has great bass. Um, yeah, I'm not into hip hop really. I, it's not my kind of thing. Um, but uh, I also, yeah, like there's, I like some of the older stuff. Like I don't know if you'd call it hip hop. <laughs> Certainly not the modern stuff. Um, but um, yeah. Um, I'm not that familiar with the modern genres that people are listening to these days, or the modern artists, I should say, um, because I, it's just not my kind of thing. Unless we're talking about like, you know, piano jazz, in which case I'm a wealth of, of knowledge on piano jazz. <laughs> Do you try to measure FR at different volumes and check which parts of the FR compress and changes more than the others? Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner does this with speakers, and I think it could be interesting. With yeah, with speakers, I I'm not too familiar with headphones. It doesn't change. Uh, well, oh, okay, it it does if you go to if you're trying to achieve max SPL, uh, you you might find some results like that. But even in an, if in an FFT, if you just change the volume, the shape isn't going to change for the frequency response between 60 dB and 100 dB for the majority of headphones and you're really listening within that range most of the time. Like you're not going outside of that. So yeah, it's not something that, uh, with the exception of those ones I mentioned before, like, you know, like the Apple AirPods Pro 2 and some of those ones that have like, you know, volume-based attenuation and stuff like that. What, what I think could be interesting and different, by the way, tons of respect for Aaron's audio corner. I love that dude. And I, yeah, that's, it's my favorite. I've been watching that speaker channel because I'm, I'm interested in getting some new speakers for my living room. And uh, that dude's channel is dope. Um, so shout out to Aaron. But I, uh, 
what I would be interested in it, it to, to kind of speak to, I think what your uh, hypothesis is there about volume and frequency response differences. I'd love to do the same testing with probe mics, <laughs> like see on actual humans to, if, if there's any change, I, I'd be more curious about that because it definitely doesn't on the rig. Uh, but cause we do measure it all kinds of different volumes. Um, Oh yeah, Chris is asking uh, what, what volumes do you measure? Um, so I don't measure at 114 dB. <laughs> if that's what you're wondering. I measure, uh, usually I try and measure around 90 at 1K, right? And the reason I do that is because I think that is a, that is like, uh, I, I will crank it to 100, even 110 sometimes, if I'm specifically trying to identify distortion profiles. But nobody should ever, nobody's, that's not a volume level that anybody needs to worry about. And when I publish measurements, it's usually at it, the 90 dB, you know, measurements taken at 90 dB. Because that is like the most representative. It doesn't test the edge case or where the limits of the headphones are. But I think, you know, at, because of what we know about auditory masking effect with volume and with music, um, it's not something that people need to worry about. Um, the exceptions are like when you have, um lower excursion limits where, which shows up in the bass and if people want to then eq that up and boost the bass to whatever 100 db because they're bass heads then you're going to hit the excursion limit and that's when it does matter right but for ordinary use normal use of those headphones or whatever headphones you're talking about i don't see a reason to measure frequency response above 90 db um, if you're measuring distortion, you want to go to 100 dB, 110, 105, you know, that makes perfect sense because then you can actually interpret the distortion or you can see it, you know, more clearly and see where the distortion rises. Because if you're measuring at 90 dB with good headphones, oftentimes that's so the distortion is low enough to where it's hard to make sense of it. Um, so, yeah, but frequency response 90 dB is fine, I think. K612 Pro is the most underrated headphone, especially on tube amps. I'll have to give it a shot. There's a lot of headphones. Okay, here's here. This is something I could use help with. I I feel that for the last little bit, when it comes to over ear headphones, things haven't changed that much. We've gotten some new ones like the Void, uh, the the Void and the the Venus. Um, we've gotten there's new ones that come out of you know some of the Chinese manufacturer brands. But there hasn't been that much big change in terms of like the, there's nothing really that, that is like, I don't know, industry shaking, you know? And I felt for a while that like, we've gotten, I don't want to think about how to say this, on the path of, of which headphones we kind of like look to, to evaluate, we tend to, I feel like all, not just me, but like all headphone reviewers kind of just go along the same path <laughs> and we all sort of tend to evaluate the same things. And the reason I'm thinking about this was something that came up with when I was thinking about the like, you know, best headphones of the year and that kind of stuff. Right. Because this stuff, like the technology doesn't progress in the same way with audio as it does in like, you know, computer chips and stuff like that. The new stuff isn't always better. And um, so what I want to know is like, what are headphones that are still available on the market that, you know, you could still buy today that, you know, just haven't been covered that even, even like popular headphones that people are buying that haven't been covered by the current trend of like, oh yeah, this is a new thing that came out. Let's review that. You know, um, I'd, I'd love to get a sense of that. I think like there are Bayer dynamic headphones. I think that's actually a good example. Um, maybe we need to cover those more but they don't i usually don't want, i don't enjoy those that much so <laughs> that's a hard it's a hard one uh but i'm thinking of other stuff like i, I, I really, want, really want to evaluate that trx00 some more stuff from fostex um you know denon as well right i want to check some of that stuff out sony you know but this is where like you know if there's anything that you guys I mean, this is also for folks who are watching afterwards. If you can think of stuff that you want us to evaluate, leave it in the comments because the more, you know, requests there are for that kind of stuff, the more, you know, the better chance there is I, I can get that kind of stuff in. 
So, yeah, Chrono loves the DT770. That's, yeah. And I, I tend to agree. I think it is still, it's too spicy for me in the treble. But, yeah, with EQ, it's, it's a really good performer. Oh, we did the Tiger 300R. My sphere. <laughs> that's, the, that's one of the silliest. <laughs> the, the, the Tiara <laughs> headphone. Yeah, we need we definitely need to do something like that, hard to. I don't know. I mean, yeah. If I was doing this independently, I would do that, but because it's not uh, you know, even though our, op our opinions are all independent opinions, but you know, we ha we have the funding, right? Like we have a there's a company here. <laughs> um, if there's enough demand for us to review a TR X0 or sorry, not TR X00, but the EMU Teak, right? If there's enough you know, then we say, oh, yeah, that's the one that we're going to target for this month, right? We can come up with a process for that. But I just, I need to know what the ones are that people are interested in, you know, that are outside the scope of the scope of the, you know, current sort of reviewer cycle that other reviewers are covering, you know, and myself included, um, you know. I mean, I mean, to a certain extent, we have to cover the stuff that's new because that's what everyone's talking about. But I know that there are stuff like the 612 that Chef Steve mentioned, you know, that's like, it, that's out there. <laughs> Um, now, now you guys have lots of, lots of suggestions, which is good. Yeah, the den and stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's a good example. Uh, do you think the RSV is the best tuned IEM under a thousand? No. 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 Did you review the Aventones? I did not, but I, <laughs> I have those drivers. <laughs> It's, it's okay. The drivers are okay. Oh man, L seven hundred. I want to get one of the, one of those in. Like, <laughs> I heard that thing. I was like, holy crap! <laughs> That's nuts. Anyways, I'm gonna leave the stream at that, guys. Uh, thanks to everybody for hanging out. Um, as usual, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, if you guys are interested in more of the information stuff and you want to chat with the community, check out the Discord link below the in the, in the video description um, and come hang out. Uh, and also uh, the Headphone Community Forum, I will try and add the links to this video for the measurements of the HM1000 uh, afterwards. I still need to do a post for that and I want to make sure my EQ settings are good. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that does it for the live stream. Uh, thanks to everybody and have a good weekend. Thanks for all of your contributions. Uh, thank you, Feature. Cheers. Um, yeah, have a good one, guys.